think we should be on and and going and moving all right good evening everybody now here's the deal we're not since we're not having the study next week it's up to you whether or not you're going to tell the other guys okay all right the guys who couldn't be here tonight you know what? If, if they show up, they show up. Okay, so, okay. Open in your Bibles, if you would, please, to Psalm chapter 19. So, Psalm 19. We'll start there tonight. Now, we're, we're a couple of weeks in now, right? So, this is when we start getting a little mentally tired, right? That's why I'm glad that it's, uh, it's only a few weeks, and we get to digest this stuff slowly over the summer and then get back to it. We'll start in Psalm 19, verse 1. I want to make sure that we continue to point one another to the Word of God as our source and as our authority. Okay, so Psalm 19, starting in verse 1, it says this, The heavens are telling of the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the work of His hands. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their utterances to the end of the world. In them he has placed a tent for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. It rejoices as a strong man to run his course. Its rising is from one end of the heavens, and its circuit to the other end of them. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. So what on earth is David talking about here? David is talking about the fact that something is shouting that God exists and it's not saying anything. Okay? So what David is saying is that his primary reassurance that God indeed exists is not that he heard the voice of God, which he he did in the sense that he was a prophet. It's not those kind of things, but there's something else that's screaming that God exists, and it's not using words. Now, gentlemen, right, don't we all know that it is very easy to communicate things without saying words? If you do do not believe me, go home and ask your wives, right? Because a lot of times they're telling us a lot, even when, maybe especially when, they're not telling us words, right? So what is David talking about here? He says this, The heavens are telling of the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. What he's telling us here is that the very existence of the earth demands somebody who designed it, somebody who created it. It is an argument for intelligent design. Okay? David is telling us that he believes in God because, or at least it's reinforced by the fact that he looks out into a sky full of stars and it's telling him so much about God. Okay? Now notice what he goes on to say. Day to day pours forth speech and night to night reveals knowledge. But then in verse 3 it says there's no speech and there's no words. Their voice is not heard. Tonight, we're going to begin to talk about what's called theology proper. And what theology proper is, is simply the study of God, okay? Now, where do we get this word from? I'll show you, okay? So theology proper is not theology with a cup of tea in your hand and your pinky out like this, okay? That might be proper theology, but that's not theology proper, okay? The word theology comes from two Greek words, as we talked about before, theos, which is God, and logos, which is word or idea or doctrine, corresponding to, as you all know, the Hebrew word davar, okay? Now I say that as a joke. I had a... a, a professor in seminary and we were first year Hebrew students and he would say all right what is this word and we would say it and he goes and that exists in what verse of the Bible and we're like how would we know we don't know he, he had a sick sense of humor so I just duplicated that for your enjoyment 
So when we talk about theology proper, we're talking about the doctrine or the study of God, okay? And so what we're going to do tonight is basically ask the, these kind of questions. Is it reasonable to believe that there is a God? Is that a rational belief or is it some crazy superstition? And then if it is reasonable to believe that there is a God, can we know him? Or can we at best just guess? Okay, so the questions that we'll be asking tonight are simply that. Is it reasonable to believe that God exists? And if it is, can we really, can we know him? All right. Now, before we get to that, I just want to take a, a quick second to define some more terms, okay? Again, remember we talked about in the, in the first week that a lot of doctrinal study is the clarification of terms, right? So theism is the belief that there is a God, okay? At least one. Now, if you believe that there's at least one God, you are a theist. If you believe there are many gods, you are a polytheist. If you believe in one God, you are a mono theist. Okay, now that this should surprise nobody at this point, right? But the Bible teaches a form of monotheism, that there is one God, all right? But now I want to spend a little time on these other terms. Now, when, when most of the time when a word it starts with a, ah, like a ah, millennial, or atheism, it means no, right? So an atheist is someone who believes there is no God anywhere. Now, before we go any further, can we prove that God exists? Well, not in a scientific way. There's only one way, really, that would really satisfy you, and that is for us to kill you, and then you will know whether or not God is real. Do we have any, any volunteers you want to help? But see, the problem is that would only help you, right? Because then we'd have to bring you back, and you'd have to credibly describe what you saw, Right? Are, are you ready? Great. Somebody give me a, did anybody bring a baseball bat or something? <laughs> all right, great. Well, I, look at all the volunteers, Ed. That's scary. No, no okay. Right, exactly, right? He said, even if somebody rose from the dead, right, in the, in the account of the rich man and Lazarus, right? Yeah. He said, even if somebody rose from the dead, they wouldn't believe. We'll get to that a little bit tonight, too. Now, atheism is the belief that there is no God anywhere. Can that be proven? Anybody? No. It cannot be proven. You know why? Because the belief of atheism is that nowhere in the universe is there any God of any sort. Now, the only way to know that would, to be true would be to search the entire universe and find a way to, to figure out whether or not there's a God anywhere at any time. And if he moves, then they're all messed up, right? So atheism is the belief that not only are there not many gods, there is not one god, there is no god in atheism. Now, believe it or not, strict atheism is somewhat rare. Okay? Most of the time when you talk to people who say they are atheists, they really are not atheists. What they are is agnostics. Okay? Again, it starts with this letter A, and what this means is no knowledge. In fact... It really means foolish, right? It means dumb, right? But don't tell them that. You'll hurt their feelings and they may slug you, right? But agnostics believe that you can never know if there's a God. They believe there could be a God, there might not be a God, but ultimately we can never really know. And so tonight, what we're asking is not the question, can we prove the existence of God to an atheist or to an ag ag agnostic? The answer is we really can't, not at least in the, in the modern scientific sense, okay? But what we can do and what we will do is ask this question, is it reasonable to believe in God? Is a belief in God something that actually makes sense Logically, or is it simply a cultural construct, or is it simply a, a, a superstition, or a way to explain away the supernatural or the natural, right? So that's what we're really going to bank on tonight, is not the question of can we prove theism, but the question of is it reasonable, 
Most agnostics and atheists, in fact, all of them would probably say, no, it's not reasonable. But we're going to challenge that a little bit. David already has. David is basically saying this. As I look up into the sky and I see the stars, I see the planets, I see all these things, he's saying it is unreasonable to suggest that those things created themselves and that those things organized themselves. Which reminds me of a famous quote, and I can't remember definitively who said it. It might even be in the notes, but we'll pretend it's not. Um, the quote goes like this. I believe in God like I believe the sun rose this morning. Not because I saw it, but because by it I see everything else. Right? Now, again, that's not going to convince someone who doesn't think it's reasonable to believe in God, but our belief in God does not really stem from scientific inquiry. It stems from a philosophical understanding that everything must be <coughs> created. So another famous dead person, a philosopher, said this, if the existence of a watch proves the existence of the watchmaker, but the existence of the world does not prove the existence of a creator, I, I consent to you calling me a fool. Oh, great. Isn't that a great quote? He's like, look, if it's unreasonable to think this didn't make itself, why is it unreasonable to think everything didn't make itself? Right? So that's what we're going to go into tonight. Now, why is this important? Why is it important to study theology proper? Why is it important to study the existence and attributes of God? Well, first of all, we're commanded to believe in God. So somebody tell me the passage of Scripture where God provides a scientific proof for the existence of God. Anybody? It's not in there, right? The Bible presupposes the existence of God, and not only that, it goes as far as to say that every human being presupposes the existence of God. Now, whether or not that idea is suppressed in them, we'll, we'll talk about. But there's, as they say, a God-shaped hole in every heart, right? We'll look at Romans 1 to show that that's biblical. Okay, but Hebrews 11:6 6 says this, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Let's just stop right there. The atheists will tell us this, okay? And we're going to think the best of our atheist friends. We're not going to make fun of them because we don't want to be made fun of by them. But the atheist says this, that a belief in theism requires faith. Are they right? Yes. What they may not be as quick to acknowledge is a belief in atheism also requires faith. Right? Because they're not everywhere all the time, so they don't know that there's no God there. They're assuming, they're believing, they're exercising faith. Now, our agnostic friends, at least they're consistent, right? They're saying it does require faith, but I don't have faith and I don't want faith. And we say, okay, at least that's a consistent point of view we can deal with, right? But Hebrews eleven six says, and without faith, it's impossible to please God. Why? For he who comes to God must believe that he is. Now we stop right there to interject. If you write in your Bibles, you might consider writing the word duh. Right? Right? You don't go to a God you don't think is real. You have to believe that God exists in order to go to him. Now, what's really interesting about this is when many of our agnostic friends are suffering, or let's say they were abused, or let's say they were mistreated, they are often, see, I can't write in English very well, angry at God. Have you ever heard that expression? Well, it's beautiful. We love that. We take those opportunities. When an agnostic is angry at God, we jump on that. Why? Because you cannot be mad at somebody you don't think exists. Right? So, okay. So we must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Right? If we don't believe there's any benefit in biblical Christianity, we're really, we're really shooting ourselves in the foot. Right? Okay. Good. Now, secondly, the Bible says that it's foolish to deny the existence of God. Uh, Psalm 14, 1, and also Psalm 53, 1 says this. It's in your notes. It says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Why? 
Why is it foolish to believe there is no God? Well, because then you have no understanding of how things came to be, and you resist an understanding of how things should go, right? And when you don't know where things come from, and you don't know how to handle with the things they are, what are you? <coughs> You're foolish, right? So the Bible, but notice here in these verses, especially Psalm 14.1 14, in your notes, the Bible is saying that an, an atheist or an agnostic is a fool morally, right? Notice what it says. Uh, they are corrupt. They've committed abominable deeds. They're not a fool cognitively, intellectually. We've got to really be careful not to make the same mistakes with them that they make with us. The assumption of many atheists and agnostic is that Christians are stupid, and we're not, right? So let's not make that same mistake and treat them as if they're stupid. They're not stupid, but they are morally foolish, okay? Awesome. Any questions, comments? Good, go ahead. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I don't know. I'd have to look. I don't have my Hebrew Bible with me. Does anybody bring one? All right. Well, I'll look it up. But let me actually let me look it up on my phone because that's a great question. So the question is for the folks at home is, is there the verb there is there or is it simply no God? OK, well, let's look at Psalm. Sorry, I'm not texting. I promise. 14.1. And we will go to Hebrew. And it says... Naval, remember the name Nabal in the Bible? It means foolish. The fool uh, in his heart, there is no God. That's what it literally says. It yeah, it has uh, the Hebrew particle ain, which is, means there is not. So, yeah, so there, it is in there. Um, but, but, yeah, but in their, in, in their heart, they're a, a Nabal, a, a, a fool. Remember the guy that, you know, wouldn't give David food? His name was Nabal. And then so David let him die and took his wife, you know. <laughs> He's saying, I wrote this song, too. So, uh, all right, good, yeah. You know, but, uh, that's, that's some sweet revenge right there. Um, okay, 1 Corinthians 1, 20 to 21 says this, Where's the wise man? Where's the scribe? Where's the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. What's his point here? His point is this. The world, that is the, the unbelieving world, the agnostic or atheistic world, thinks we're foolish and that's how God wants it. He uses the foolishness of the gospel to save. Okay, why? Because he doesn't, he wants to use he doesn't use the best and the brightest. He wants to use lesser vessels so that he shines more brightly. No offense to any of us personally, right? But he asks, where's the wise men of the age? All the, 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 you know, the well-respected philosophical intelligentsia in our culture, the vast majority of them deny the existence of God. That's the way God wants it because he doesn't want our faith to be in the academy in the school, in our professors, he wants our faith to be in his word, okay? That's why he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of the cross, even though uh, the world thinks it's foolish. Okay, good. Now, Psalm 10, 4. says this, The wicked in the haughtiness of his countenance does not seek him. All his thoughts are, there is no God. Now, this is what we call practical atheism. And even Christians who believe in God sometimes live as if they don't, right? At least for a while, until God gets a hold of them and changes them, right? And he says this, the wicked in the haughtiness of his countenance, what is that? It's just a fancy way of saying his pride, his arrogance does not seek him. All his thoughts are, hey, nothing's going to happen to me. All right, so let's get back to this idea of wickedness, unrighteousness, and arrogance. The world, those who deny the existence of God or at least resist the existence of God, they, broad strokes, not all of them, but they act a certain way. Why? Because they don't think 
punishment is coming, right? And so they do not seek him. All their thoughts are, there is no God. Now, I love this quote by A.W. Tozer in your notes. I'm going to really, really implore you to buy a book. Uh, In fact, we'll do the... uh, well, we'll do the show and tell later, but it's called The Knowledge of the Holy by A.W. Tozer. It is an absolute classic. It will keep you up at night, but maybe not, but it is a very, very great book. Okay, it says this, We tend by a secret law of the soul to move toward our mental image of God. What does this mean? This means what we believe dictates our attitudes and our actions, Right? How many of you grew up, uh, just, just I could tell by the eyes, we don't need stories yet, we'll talk about it later, but how, how many of you grew up with parents who never disciplined you once? Right? It produces a different kind of person, doesn't it, than those of us who grew up with parents that disciplined us from time to time or disciplined us all the time. You act a different way when you don't think there's repercussions. Right? Awesome. Okay. So belief in God is foundational. Without God... Christianity is absolutely false and useless. Now, we have to get that out, right? We will not be satisfied, friends, with the argument that says this. It may not be true, but it's still better. If it's not true, it's not better, right? As, as Paul would argue in 1 Corinthians 15 with regard to the resurrection, right? If that's not real, we are of all men mo- most to be what? Pitied. Why? Because if God's not real, we're missing the best stuff, right? Because we give up things, we discipline ourselves because we believe that God is honored when we do, right? So let's dispense with that. Uh, A lot of times people think that they're doing Christianity a favor by saying, hey, it may not be true, but it's still a better life. In some ways, obviously, it is a better life, but uh, if it's not true, it's, it's kind of useless, right? All right, good. Now, It's also important to our lives that we understand God. It defines why we're supposed to live. So if you would turn with me to Acts 17, verses 26 to 28. I do not remember off the top of my head what those verses say. So we will look at those, and hopefully they will tell us something that makes sense. Okay, so Acts chapter 17, verse 26. Okay, yes, this is good. Um, I put these notes together so long ago that sometimes if if the reference is wrong, I'm just going to be embarrassed in front of you guys. That's fine, right? You know, we're men. We can handle it, right? Uh, But here in Acts chapter 17, starting in verse 26, it says, this is Paul preaching. He says, and he, that's God, made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. Why did God do this? Why did God make us when he made us? He didn't make us Africans. He made us Americans. He didn't make us in the 15th century. He made us in the, what is it, the 20, 21st, right? You know, it's the math. I'm not good with the, it's the 20, 2000, so it's the 21st century, right? Verse 27 tells us, He made us that we would seek God, if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. The purpose of our existence is to seek God. That's why he made us. All right, he made us to seek him, to delight in him, to be blessed uh, by him. Okay, it defines our purpose. Secondly, it defines our parameters. This simply means this. Who God is must first be understood and appreciated, if we desire to do what he says to do. Oftentimes in the Bible, God starts a passage of commands by saying, I am the Lord your God. Then he'll command, and then he'll say, I am the Lord your God. I'm convinced the reason why he does that is because we obey because of who he is. Just like fathers, sometimes if you ever look at your kids and you say, because I'm your father, right? Right? When I used to discipline, especially Jonathan, when he was littler, I could never discipline Bethany. She, she's a girl, and she has power over me that nobody ever will, right? But, uh, 
But with Jonathan, I used to always say, now, now who am I? And, and you'd say, you're, you're daddy. I go, yeah, I'm daddy. Here's what we need to do. Again, who are you? You're, I'm, I'm your son. Who am I? I'm your daddy. And then I would say, how long is daddy angry? And he would say, a second. And I would say, and how long does daddy love you? And he would say, forever. That's how we used to do that. And um, it's true, right? But we, we need to remind ourselves that, okay, we act a certain way because God is God, and he deserves to be obeyed. So I, I love this, again, from A.W. Tozer. A right conception of God is basic not only to systematic theology, but to practical Christian living as well. It is to worship what the foundation is to the temple. Where it is inadequate or out of plumb, the whole structure must sooner or later collapse. I believe, he says, there is scarcely an error in doctrine or a failure in applying Christian ethics that cannot be traced finally to imperfect and ignoble thoughts about God. What is he saying? He's saying if you believe that God is not the kind of God that punishes sin, you're going to act like it. Right? If you believe God is a pushover, if he's an old man with a long gray beard that just wants to treat you like Santa Claus, you're going to act that way. But if you believe God is transcendently holy, which we would have talked about next week, but we're going to kick down the, the curb a little bit just to keep you interested. If you believe that God is transcendently holy, then you understand that he wants us to be holy. That's why the Bible can command us, be perfect like your heavenly father is perfect. Can we do that? No, not perfectly. But that's what he is who he is defines what we should be, okay? It's also important in our worship. Um, I, don't know, I don't know if you've ever had the experience of worshiping in a church that doesn't really believe God is real. I have, right? I, I've been in some really weird liberal churches, you know, not as a pastor, obviously, but just, you know, for, you know, whether it's visiting family or if it's just pure old-fashioned sick curiosity. And... And let me tell you, the, the worship is decidedly different when it's all about tradition and all about morality and all about whatever instead of actually believing God is real. To the point of amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a what? Wretch like me. You know, some churches change that. I mean, that saved a man like me. Right? They don't want to believe they're wretches. Well, if you believe God is who he says he is, you automatically believe you're kind of wretched. It's the way it goes. But if you believe that God is simply one of us, just maybe a little bit bigger or a little bit older or a little bit stronger, well, your life is going to uh, reflect that and your worship is. So in Exodus 15:1, it says, Then Moses and the sons of Israel sang this song to the Lord and said, I will sing to the Lord for he is highly exalted. The horse and its rider he has hurled into the sea. Psalm 106, 12. Then they believed his words and they sang his praise. Isaiah 12, 5. Praise the Lord in song. Why? For he has done excellent things. Let this be known throughout the earth. It's also important for the content of our worship. There are some songs, I won't pick on them, but there are some songs... That, that many Christian churches sing, and I, maybe we do, I, I, I don't know, but songs that really don't need God to be real for the songs to be true. Like, you know, constantly saying things like, I love you, I love you, I love you. Well, who? What? Why? Right? And so as you become even more theologically minded, you'll, you'll start to sing and you'll start to say, well, you know, okay, let me give you an example. I don't think we've ever, ever sing, sang this song. Have you ever heard the song, I'm Trading My Sorrows? It's, it's great words at first, but then it goes, yes, 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 Lord. Yes, 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 Lord. Yes, 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 Lord. Amen. Yeah, the most irritating thing you've ever heard in your life. We used to sing that song in Michigan, and sometimes I would lap into Spanish, C, 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 just to mix it up a little bit, right? See, we can become vapid in our worship if we don't have a proper sense of, of how great and how big he is. Uh, so we see the quote again from A.W. Tozer, The Knowledge of the Holy, available now. It says, uh, Let us beware 
lest we in our pride accept the erroneous notion that idolatry consists only in kneeling before visible objects of adoration and that civilized people are therefore free from it. The essence of idolatry is the entertainment of thoughts about God that are unworthy of him. That statement is worth the price of the book, which is very reasonable, by the way. Reasonable, by the way. Good for 10 bucks, less than 10 bucks. The essence of idolatry is the entertainment of thoughts about God that are unworthy of him. It begins in the mind and may be present where no overt act of worship has ever taken place or has taken place. See, we tend to think that the idolaters are the ones that kneel before statues. And they are, right? And that idolaters are the ones that maybe have beads around their neck or do things like that. And maybe they are, but we can also be idolaters by just not having a grand enough sense of God, right? All right, it's good. It's also important in the church. It establishes where our commitments are. It counsels and encourages us. If God is real, he will deliver on his promises. One more quote, at least, from Tozer. So necessary to the church is a lofty concept of God that when that concept in any measure declines, the church with her worship and her moral standards declines along with it. The first step down for any church is taken when it surrenders its high opinion of God. Now, I don't know, you know we go to a great church. I love our church. Uh, we love each other, okay? And I don't want to make other churches always the bad guy. But have you ever honestly just asked yourself the question, why on earth are churches doing these things? Things like, you know, like swirly slides into the baptistry. Like, that's a thing. Like, churches have that. You slide down the slide into the baptistry. Why are they doing that? Well, they're not doing that because they wake up one day and they go, you know what, we're going to blaspheme today. No, they just wake up one day and God just doesn't seem that deep to them anymore. Right? And so why, why are so many churches just doing bizarre things? I, I know of a church, I, I won't tell you, uh, where it is, but it's in the state of Missouri. And uh, I, I know a church that had a free, uh, it was, their preaching series was on, it was called like God in the Movies, which sounds really interesting to me. I like movies, I like God. But it turned out they were just watching movies. And if you got there the first time, if you're a first time visitor, you got two free movie tickets. And, and if you got there on time, you got buckets of popcorn but they're, watch, they're not watching Christian movies. They're just watching like regular movies. And it never really got around. The guy would come out and say, what do you think? Find God in that movie. Well, they don't do that because they want to dishonor God at first. They do that just because they think if we just talked about him, nobody'd show up. So I think, okay, I'm preaching now, right? But that's what I do. You'll forgive me, right? Okay. <laughs> Our mission is not only to convince the world that God is real. Our mission is to convince the world that God is compelling. That he's enough. Right? Good. So is it then reasonable to believe that there's a God? Well, Non-evangelical approaches, we already talked about this a little bit. Atheism is the, the idea that there is no God. Agnosticism is the idea that it's impossible to know that if there is a God. And one that I didn't bring up because it's probably the one we interact with the least is what's called pantheism. All right. Pantheism is the idea that everything's God. Like everything's divine. And we see this like in, in philosophies and stuff where, you know, a lot of like crystals and a lot of, you know, like new age ideas that are probably not in the forefront of most of our experience. But they, I remember in college, I wrote a, a paper. I was in a secular college before I went to seminary and, and it was about God. And I found out that the professor was a pantheist. And so she wrote on my paper, she gave me a good grade, so. But she wrote on the paper, I, I believe in God but I just believe that everything is God. Well, if everything's God, then nothing's God, right? So, you know what I mean? So we'll, we'll do with that. We won't spend much time with that. So is it 
reasonable to believe that there is a God? Answer, yes. All right. Here's why. The argument from cause and effect. Now, again, we're, we're not proving the existence of God. We're asking, is it reasonable? Well, here's the thing. Every effect has a cause, right? Right? So if you walk into your living room and your couch is on fire and your kid's standing next to it with matches in his hand, right? And you say to him, why is the couch on fire? And they go, it's a miracle. I have no idea, right? We know that's, that's unreasonable. Things don't just burst into flames, all right? There's, for every effect, there's a cause. Now, the problem is, uh, if we keep going back and keep going back, eventually, we have to come to a position of the first cause, okay? And our options are this. Either everything always existed, just in different forms, that's what the atheism teaches, that everything has always existed, but the powers of nature, whatever that is, and random, uh, you know, evolutionary processes shape everything and change everything. So either everything has always existed or one thing has always existed. All right? Theism is the belief that there is a God who is the first cause. That's a reasonable thing to believe because as you count back from every effect, eventually you have to get to some first cause. So atheism can believe that nothing created everything, or that create, everything was created from nothing, theism believes that everything was created by a creator. And so that's a reasonable assumption to make. Again, we're not, that doesn't prove the God of the Bible. It just proves that it's reasonable to believe that there's a God. Secondly, there's the argument from beauty and order. And this goes down